glucagon and epinephrine are going to go up. Okay? And their job is to get blood glucose levels back up. So how do they do that? First thing that happens is we break down our glycogen stores in the liver to get free glucose. And the liver will secrete that into the bloodstream. Okay? That's the first thing that happens. Break down our glycogen in the liver to yield free glucose for the rest of the body, for the brain. The second thing that happens, I haven't listed because it goes against the catabolic reaction. It's actually an anabolic. What does glucagon also stimulate? Gluconeogenesis. Right, okay, perfect. But that's not a catabolic reaction, it's an anabolic reaction. So that both, so with insulin, we see insulin catalyzes or stimulates anabolic reaction, reactions, except for glycolysis, which is the breakdown, okay? And on the flip side of the coin, glucagon stimulates catabolic reactions, except for the synthesis of glucose, which is anabolic. So the breakdown of glucose and the synthesis of glucose go against the common theme, all right? So first you break down your glycogen, then you go into gluconeogenesis, then you go into fats in that way. Now, there's also one other enzyme, excuse me, one other hormone, and that's the hormone which stimulates gluconeogenesis in addition to glucagon, cortisol. and it's cortisol. That is the steroid hormone. So associate cortisol with uh, gluconeogenesis. Yeah, stress. And that's what you guys, you guys are going to have very high levels of cortisol in the next month. You will. <laughs> and what, well, what happens is when you're done, you'll hear this from John too. When you finish your boards, a lot of people get really sick. It's because their cortisol levels crash and then the body crashes. So we should be eating more level of brain inside. Try not to get stressed out. Just take it in stride. <laughs> How's that? I think that's a better approach. Like you could do that. Okay, so let's go over here. It's your choice. All right, here's glycolysis. What do you guys need to know about glycolysis? Glycolysis is the oxidation of glucose the two molecules of pyruvate. That's glycolysis. Oxidation of glucose, the two molecules of pyruvate. The energy yield in glycolysis is 2 ATP. We get 2 ATP in glycolysis. There's only three enzymes that you guys are going to need to know for the boards. And they are the three regulatory enzymes which I tried to pound into your head. Okay. They are hexokinase. And remember, hexokinase catalyzes the same reaction as glucokinase. Two separate enzymes catalyzing the same reaction. And this is a reaction I've seen a lot of questions on the board about, so we'll go over it. Okay. Hexokinase, let me just do this. Glucokinase is in the liver only. That's the way to say this. This reaction is glucose plus ATP. It goes to glucose 6 phosphate plus ADP. Again, what class of enzyme? Say kinase. What's it doing? Transferring a phosphate bond. So it's a transferase. Okay, that's the association you need to know. Okay, it's transferring a phosphate from ATP over here. This is the reaction which is catalyzed by these two enzymes. Glucokinase is only found in the liver. It has a lower affinity for glucose than hexokinase. So it has a higher Kn. You'll, I, I've seen this a lot. This reaction. They ask which enzyme catalyzes it, what class of enzyme. Okay, 
What's important about this by putting this phosphate on the glucose? What do we do? We, when you put a phosphate on any molecule, when it comes inside the cell, it does something to it. Trap it. And traps it. Traps it inside the cell. Okay, so that ensures that whatever glucose we're bringing in is not going anywhere. Now it's a, it's only going it's going to stay in the cell, and we can metabolize it. So that's the first regulatory enzyme. The second one is the rate limiting one, and this is the most important. And this is PFK. Do I need to write that out? Phospho fructokinase. Yes. No. Do they use symbols like PFK, or do they use full name? Oh, good question. Think. Phosphofructokinase, that catalyzes fructose 6-phosphate plus ATP. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate plus ADP. Okay, what class of enzyme? Transferase. It's a kinase. It utilizes ATP. These are the two enzymes which utilize ATP in glycolysis. Where do we get our net ATP back? That's at the third regulatory enzyme, and that's pyridine kinase. Pyruvate kinase, that's phosphophenyl pyruvate, PEP, going to pyruvate. Right, let me rewrite that, sorry. It's two phosphoenyl pyruvate plus 2 ADP going to 2 pyruvate plus 2 ATP. That's where we get our net gain of ATP back, right there. That's where we get our net gain of ATP. Just let's look up here for glycolysis real quick. This step is the hexokinase, and this step is PFK. This is where we use our ATP. Now we still have a six carbon molecule, but we put two phosphates on either side, and that's when we split the guy in half in the next reaction. And from here on out, everything is double. And here, this step, you don't need to worry about this one. This is just where we get our ATP back, which we used up here. And this last step, the formation of pyruvate by pyruvate kinase, that's where we get our net gain of ATP. That's it. That's glycolysis. That's what you need to know of glycolysis. Let's carry forward and down. When oxygen is present, so this is a key point, when oxygen is present, the pyruvate will go down into the Krebs cycle. So under aerobic conditions. Because remember we have the, the Cori cycle under anaerobic conditions, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Let's just go straight down into Krebs cycle. The first enzyme, so the pyruvate, oh, where does glycolysis occur? They ask these questions. Glycolysis, so where's glycolysis occur? <coughs> cytosol. Cytosol. Or the cytoplasm. Those are questions you'll get. The pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, and then we start a whole new series of reactions. The first reaction, it's pyruvate going to acetyl-CoA. That's the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. Pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, pyruvate dehydrogenase. That's a regulatory enzyme, so that's an important one that you should know. Pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. It's a dehydrogenase, so which class of enzyme in? Dehydrogenase. Oxidoreductase. Yeah, a redox. Oxidoreductase. Okay, dehydrogenase. 
If it's a redox, you guys have to know that an oxidation reduction occurred. So that should click you into coenzymes. If you take a look here, that's where we make NADH. Okay, NAD gets reduced to NADH. NADH complex, is what you're talking about. Yes. Your notes are saying oxidative decarboxylation. Right. We're, go, we're going right there now. Okay. There's another thing that happens in this complex in this reaction is that CO2 is lost. So pyruvate has three carbons, acetyl CoA only has two carbons. So we're taking one of the carbons off. And remember this reaction is tw occurring twice because we have two pyruvates. So this is what's referred to as oxidative decarboxylation. It's it's a little complicated. Oxidative because we're doing an oxidation reduction to make NADH. Decarboxylation because we're losing CO2. So what's the other coenzyme which is involved? Thiamine, perfect. Thiamine. <coughs> now what's the, now take a look up here. We're forming coenzyme, we're forming acetyl-CoA and that comes from coenzyme A binding with two carbons to form acetyl CoA. So what other vitamins require? Coenzyme A. Coenzyme A. What's the no coenzyme A? B5, which is antithenic acid, which is a part of coenzyme A. So that's the type of stuff, you know, you may see they'll ask you, you gotta make those associations, okay? And you may get a reaction say which vitamins are involved. But you know what? It's much easier than that. They'll have coenzyme A and say, what's the vitamin for it? And you'll go, antiphenic acid, B5. But I'm just trying to bring this up so you see them in these reactions. Okay. Acetyl-CoA enters <coughs> the Krebs cycle. And I'm going to give you a quick overview. I'm going to tell you you need to know every reaction of the Krebs cycle. There's eight of them. So that's one thing. There are eight reactions in the Krebs cycle. There are three NADH, two FA, excuse me, three NADH, one FADH2, and one GTP made per term of the parasite. And remember, there's two acetyl CoAs made, so you go through the cycle twice per molecule of glucose. Let me just tell you this, and you're going to have to look at this on your own. There are two other steps which are oxidative decarboxylations. That's isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. They catalyze reactions where you both gain NADH, so it's an oxidation reduction, and you lose CO2, so oxidative decarboxylation. So one of the things you guys do have to memorize is all the steps of the Krebs cycle. Now let me just give you a couple points, some bullets to remember, okay? Citrate and malate are the two intermediates which can cross the mitochondrial membrane. Citrate and malate, those are the two intermediates. Citrate crosses the mitochondrial membrane during fatty acid synthesis. Citrate crosses the membrane during fatty acid synthesis. And why citrate goes across the membrane is because that's how it shuttles acetyl-CoA into the cytoplasm, because fatty acid synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. We'll get back to it in a minute. Okay? Malate crosses the membrane during gluconeogenesis. So there are two different reasons. Citrate, fat synthesis. Malate, synthesis of glucose. Which one? Citrate. Citrate is taking 
acetyl-CoA. All right, in the Krebs cycle, so that's, that was really quick on the Krebs cycle. You guys just have to know it, okay? It's not worth me going through it. The main thing that happens in the Krebs cycle is we make a lot of NADH and a lot of FADH2, okay? Those are reduced coenzymes, and those go to the electron transport chain, which is briefly shown right here. So what happens here, just big picture stuff, is NADH and FADH2 simply drop off their electrons because they're reduced. They drop off their electrons, the electron transfer chain. Huge point, what's the ultimate acceptor of electrons? Oxygen. oxygen. That's why you need oxygen for aerobic respiration to occur, because it's the acceptor of electrons. Now, electron transport is this part. ATP synthesis occurs over here. Electron transport and ATP synthesis are coupled. Okay? They are coupled processes. Electron transport and ATP synthesis are coupled. The coupling of electron transport with ATP synthesis, another term for that is called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation. And that's because in the electron transport chain, you're oxidizing. You're handing off electrons. You're reducing, you're oxidizing, reducing, oxidizing. And then protons get pumped out. I'm not going to get into this. Protons flow back through, and you make ATP. So that's the phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation. They are a couple processes. Make sure you know that 2,4-dinitrophenol, 2,4-DNP, is the classic uncoupler between electron transport and ATP synthesis. 2,4-DNP, the classic uncoupler. So look in your book about that, but just that's the one they'll ask you about. Also, I'm not going to go over now, know the inhibitors of the electron transport chain. Specifically, um, carbon monoxide, CO, what is it, retinone, R-E-T-E-N-O-N-E, retinone, amytal, A-M-Y-T-A-L, and cyanide, thank you, cyanide. So that's right in your book, right in your Lippincott book, they show you exactly where it is, okay? In, am I clear on that? The electron transport chain. It's called amytal. It's A M Y T A L. So just there's, if you look at the electron transport chain, I think it's the first page. It's just right there. These are the inhibitors. <coughs> What's a very important supplement that people are taking now, which is part of the electron transport chain? Coenzyme Q. Okay. <coughs> know that that is a component of the electron transport chain. There's another name for coenzyme Q. It's called ubiquinone. Let me write that down. CoQ equals ubiquinone. the other, there's cytochrome C. Know the components, that's what I'll just tell you right now. Okay? Know the components of the other. You don't need to memorize every little thing about them like you did for my class. Okay? You just need to know there's complex 1, there's complex 2, there's coenzyme Q, there's complex 3, there's complex 4. Okay? You don't need to know everything about them. So we just flew through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron. Let's just do the Cori cycle. It's C O R I. The Cori cycle occurs under anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic conditions. That's where 
pyruvate, well, I should put it here. Pyruvate stops, it gets blocked right there. It does not go into the PDH complex, it does not go into the Krebs cycle. The Cori cycle involves the conversion of pyruvate to lactate in the muscle. Pyruvate to lactate in the muscle. And the enzyme which catalyzes that, this is an important enzyme, is lactate dehydrogenase. Lactate dehydrogenase. So that is pyruvate to lactate in the muscle. Then the lactate travels to the liver. Where it gets converted back to pyruvate by the same enzyme. The enzyme is reversible. And then the pyruvate undergoes gluconeogenesis and is converted to glucose. And then the glucose gets shipped back to the muscle. That's the Cori cycle. very close to finishing up. So that's the breakdown of glucose. Glycolysis, yeah. Um, the, what was the enzyme which catalyzes or where it It's the same it's, it's the same enzyme, it's reversible. You just have it in different tissues. Okay, so it just depends on if you have, if you have high levels of pyruvate, that enzyme will convert it to lactate. If you have high levels of lactate, that enzyme will convert it to pyruvate. Right, so, in, so what you need to key on is in the muscle, your pyruvate levels go way up because it can't get into the Krebs cycle. So that enzyme goes, okay, we'll convert it to lactate. And then the muscle makes a lot of the lactate and ships that off to the liver. So the liver is sitting there and all of a sudden it gets this huge influx of lactate. And so the, the enzyme in the liver goes, oh, I'll convert that to pyruvate. Okay, so that's just that. This is all breakdown of food. Let's talk about glycogen synthesis and glycogen breakdown. Very easy, you guys. Very, very simple. So we're talking about what's happening in the presence of which hormone. We've gone through glycolysis, and now we're going to talk about glycogen synthesis. Insulin. Insulin. Okay, okay. You only, you're going to make glycogen when you have high levels of glucose. Yeah, okay. You know that. You know that. Okay. No problem. So the rate limiting enzyme of glycogen synthesis is glycogen synthase. synthase. Okay. It's not any more complicated than that. This is a good thing to remember. UDP glucose, that's an intermediate in glycogen synthesis. UDP glucose. That, what that is, is that forms a high energy sugar, high energy sugar. And the enzyme glycogen synthase takes UDP glucose and cleaves off the UDP and hands off that glucose to the glycogen. Okay, so in the presence of insulin, we've gone through glycolysis. Now we've just stored excess glucose as glycogen. This is all happening in the liver. And now what's the third thing we're going to do if we have more glucose? Fat. Fat. Perfect. Okay? So fat synthesis begins from acetyl-CoA. Fat synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. Where is acetyl-CoA made? In the mitochondria. So Leslie, this goes back to your question. So how does the acetyl-CoA get back to the cytoplasm? Citrate. Okay, so what you need to think about is, let me just throw this up real quick, is oxaloacetate, which has four carbons, combines with acetyl-CoA, which has two carbons, to form citrate, which has six carbons. That happens in the mitochondria. The citrate then crosses the membrane back to the cytosol, and it gets cleaved back to oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. And then the acetyl-CoA can, can uh, function 
as a starting material for fat synthesis. All right? Everyone get that? What's the first reaction in fat synthesis? Acetyl-CoA plus, plus, it goes to malonyl, plus, acetyl-CoA has how many carbons? Two. Two. How many does malonyl-CoA have? Three. So what do you have to add to it? CO2. CO2. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase catalyzes the very first reaction. That's the rate limiting enzyme of fatty acid synthesis. So what do you think insulin does to that enzyme? Does it turn it on or turn it off? It turns it on. What do you think it does to glycogen synthase? It turns it on. What do you think it does to the glycolytic enzyme? Enzymes. It turns them on. Okay? That's what insulin does. It turns because those are the pathways which insulin stimulates. Okay? Now, so just stay with me. So now we start making a fatty acid. And what's the fatty acid we make? Palmitic acid. 16 carbons. There's a common, God, this was a nightmare slide for you guys on overhead. The process of making fats, it's just a cycle, one after another. You keep adding carbons two at a time. There's a series of reactions which occurs. Okay. In fatty acid synthesis, it's reduction, dehydration, reduction. I've seen this question asked several times. There's a series of reactions that you have to do to the acetyl-CoA to make a saturated fatty acid. Reduction, dehydration, reduction. Those three. So you should write that down. Those three happen over and over to make a fatty acid. Reduction, dehydration, reduction. Now my question to you is, what is the reducing power which is used in the reductions? Because it's an oxidation. NADH. NADPH. Perfect. So this, I'm trying to connect a few of these, all of these loose ends. So NADPH is the reducing power in fatty acid synthesis. That's how it'll be stated in the test. <coughs> Once you make a fatty acid, what happens to it? We're in the presence of insulin. We're going to do what with it? What's the liver going to do with that fatty acid? So it's going to make a triglyceride. Perfect. What's the triglyceride going to get packaged in? No, just hold on. VLDL. The VLDL is made in the liver. So we're not talking about dietary fat. We're talking about liver. What's going to happen to the VLDL? It's going to go into the bloodstream and go to the adipose if, we're not, if we want to store it, or it'll go to the muscle if the muscle needs energy in the form of fat. Okay? You guys get that connection? So if you keep that in your head, let me just run through it again. High, we just eat a bunch of pasta. High carbohydrates. Insulin goes into the bloodstream. Insulin stimulates the uptake of um, all the sugar. The body will go through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain to get all its energy. Once the energy needs are met, if there's extra glucose, insulin will turn on the enzyme to make glycogen and will store our glucose as glycogen. Once those stores get filled, we'll take the extra glucose, we'll convert it to fats, we'll package the fats as triglycerides, we'll ship those off in VLDL. If you guys, I and mean, that's a third of metabolism right there. Okay. Is that is that clear? Great. Now, let's go over to the hexose monophosphate shunt because this ties in, right? This ties in perfectly. The hexose monophosphate shunt, aka the pentose phosphate pathway. <coughs> HMP shunt or pentose phosphate pathway. This only occurs for two reasons, and this is all you have to know about it. It's used to make NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate. The ribose 5-phosphate is used to make okay. nucleic acids because it's ribose. So just reiterate, pentose or phosphate shunt or the HMP shunt 
you make NADPH and ribose 5 phosphate. What is the NADPH used for? Fatty acid synthesis, perfect. And for making nucleic acids, and for making cholesterol. It's the reducing power used in anabolic reactions. So do you think the HMP shunt's gonna be turned on in the presence of insulin? You betcha. <coughs> Great, you guys got everything associated with insulin. Glucagon, now, okay, so you beat, you pass out. You sleep, okay, or you go to class, whatever. You pass out, <coughs> hours, you sit in class for hours, and all of a sudden your blood glucose levels hit rock bottom. Glucagon gets secreted. What happens when glucagon is secreted? Glucagon slash epinephrine slash cortisol. Okay, because all three of those are involved in what's gonna happen. First thing that's gonna happen with by glucagon, we're gonna break down our glycogen, right here. The rate limiting enzyme and glycogen breakdown, glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase, so that's the rate limiting enzyme, glycogen breakdown. The liver does this to yield free glucose for the rest of the body. Once those stores run out, which they do pretty quick, we'll start doing gluconeogenesis in the liver wall. And that is stimulated by both glucagon and cortisol. And then thirdly, we'll start breaking down our fats, which we have stored in the adipose tissue. And the hormone which stimulates that is epinephrine. So now we're breaking down fats. These are the triglycerides in the adipose. We'll break them down to fatty acids and glycerol. So let's take a look at what the fatty acids do. The fatty acids, and we'll just keep it simple, they're going to go to the liver, and they are going to get carried into the liver cells and then into the mitochondria because fatty acid breakdown, which is beta oxidation, occurs in the mitochondria. So fatty acid synthesis is in the cytosol, beta oxidation is in the mitochondria. What are fatty acids broken down to? Acetyl-CoA. If you don't know the answer, if you know the flip side of the coin, you've got it. If, you, if I ask you, what is so-and-so broken down to? If you don't know the answer, ask yourself, what is it made from? And that'll tell you what it's broken down to. You know, what's glycogen broken down to? Glucose. What's glycogen made from? Glucose. What are fatty acids made from? Acetyl-CoA. What are fatty acids broken down to? Acetyl-CoA. The process of converting fatty acids to acetyl-CoA is beta-oxidation. Oh, and I skipped one thing. The transport system for getting the fatty acids into the mitochondria is what? The carnitine shuttle. Very good. The carnitine shuttle. That, you'll see that for sure. Carnitine is what transports fatty acids into the mitochondria. The alanine shuttle. That has to do with protein metabolism because then we're talking about the nitrogen. Okay. Beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondria. What are the three reactions which occur over and over in beta oxidation? Oxidation, hydration, oxidation. The exact opposite of fatty acid synthesis. Oxidation, hydration, oxidation. Okay, it's the exact opposite. And we take, so here's how simple the questions are on the um, I ring, not on the national boards. How many molecules of acetyl CoA are made from uh, a 16 carbon fatty acid? Eight. Eight. Okay. Acetyl CoA has two carbons. Palmitic or 16 carbons has 16. Just divide whatever it is by two. Because acetyl CoA has two carbons. So you get eight molecules of acetyl CoA. 
And then that acetyl-CoA just goes into the Krebs cycle. You make a bunch of NADH and FADH2. That goes in the electron transport chain. You get a lot of energy. All right? What happens when we get too much acetyl-CoA? <coughs> they go to ketone bodies. Ketone bodies. Now, we're talking about breakdown. So when we break down too many fats, and we just load ourselves up with acetyl-CoA, they go to ketone bodies. The two ketone bodies, and you guys need to know this, are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Those are ketone bodies. The beta-hydroxybutyrate, another name for that is 3-hydroxybutyrate. Okay, the beta and the number 3 carbon are the same. Um, acetoacetate. These are the two ketone bodies which the body can metabolize and use for energy. They are made from what? Acetyl-CoA. These are made in the liver and can be shipped off to heart muscle, muscle, brain. What do you think the brain converts them to? No. No. What are they made from? Acetyl-CoA. What do they get broken down to? Acetyl-CoA. Okay. Then what happens to the acetyl-CoA? It goes into the Krebs cycle. So what happens, so the point I'm trying to get across here is let's say we, we ship them to the heart muscle or whatever. This is a way to get that heart muscle acetyl-CoA by make, converting it to ketone bodies which are able to get out of the liver and into the blood. Then they go to the next tissue and the next tissue says, thanks, I'll convert them right back to acetyl-CoA and then they can get energy from did you get that? You're either talking about um, oh ketoacidosis or excess ketone bodies. You get mostly in diabetics, right? So there's an overproduction. So the numbers just can't handle. Right. We don't. Yeah. You just get too many. That's a very simplistic answer, but that's the bottom line, okay? All right, we're almost done, guys. We're very close. Whew. The urea cycle. Do the urea cycle. Where does the urea cycle occur? Which organ? The liver. Liver. What's it used for? Getting rid of excess nitrogen. Yes. Where does what's the excess nitrogen usually come from? Protein, right? Right. From the amino acids. Very good. Okay. There's an acronym you need to know here. ARCO. A R C O. A R C O. And that will tell you the amino acids which are involved in urea cycle. The A R is arginine. The C is citrulline. O is ornithine. And this is how the body deals with excess nitrogen or ammonia, however you want to say it. And this occurs in the liver. Arginine. Now, both ornithine and citrulline those are considered amino acids. They are amino acids. We just don't incorporate those into proteins. So the only time you see them is in this urea cycle. Okay? Those are just two amino acids which are not incorporated into proteins. They are not. summarize this mess in this slide. Oh, there's, okay, there's a couple things. I knew I was forgetting something. Remember in glycolysis when I said you get two ATP? And then we talked about getting ATP in the electron transport chain. Those occur by different mechanisms. In the electron transport chain, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. 
Whenever you make ATP right on the spot, that's substrate level phosphorylation. Those are two distinct ways to make ATP. When oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is the electron transport chain. Substrate level phosphorylation is when the enzyme makes the ATP right there. Does that occur in the cycle? The one time it does, yes, where you make GTP, that's also an example of substrate level phosphorylation. Hang in there for one second. Here is the ultimate review. Um, follow the arrows and let's just see what happens in the presence of insulin or glucagon. In the presence of insulin, we bring in glucose. We'll go down here through glycolysis to acetyl-CoA, the Krebs cycle. We'll get plenty of energy, okay? If we have an excess of glucose, which is likely to occur, we'll also take that up to glycogen. If we have even more glucose, we'll take the acetyl-CoA, we'll make fatty acids, and convert them to triglycerides. Those are the things that happen with insulin. In the presence of glucagon, what we're going to do is we're going to break down our glycogen to get free glucose in the liver, and that'll be secreted into the bloodstream. Then, what we can do is we can take pyruvate and we can make glucose, that's gluconeogenesis. And then thirdly, we can take our triglycerides in the adipose tissue, convert them to fatty acids and glycerol. The fatty acids come this way into acetyl-CoA, where we make energy, the glycerol goes here and up to glucose, and the liver secretes that, so it's more glucose. This is also showing that in the presence of glucagon, you can have protein breakdown as well. Those amino acids will go into the Krebs cycle for energy, or they'll go into pyruvate to make glucose. Also, since you're breaking down amino acids, you're going to have a big, you're going to have a buildup of nitrogen, so they can recycle it. That's metabolism. Okay, congratulations. Good luck. You guys did yourself a big favor. You'll do very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, that was worth leaving Half Moon Bay for. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>